Hello, this is Marla Dalton, Executive Director and CEO of the National Foundation for Infectious Diseases, or NFID. Welcome to this episode of the Schaffner Report on new vaccines to protect against respiratory syncytial virus, RSV. We often think of RSV as a disease that primarily affects young children, but according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, RSV is also a significant cause of respiratory illness in older adults and is estimated to cause up to 160,000 hospitalizations and 10,000 deaths each year in the US among adults aged 65 years and older. In May of 2023, the US Food and Drug Administration, FDA, approved two new RSV vaccines for older adults. And in June, the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices, ACIP, recommended that the vaccines be available to adults aged 60 and older based on shared clinical decision-making with a healthcare professional. With me today is NFID Medical Director, Dr. Bill Schaffner, to share his insights on what this all means for adults in the US. Bill, thanks so much again for joining. Always good to be with you. There's always something new, Marla. <laughs> Indeed. So Bill, let's start with an overview of these RSV vaccines that were recommended by ACIP. Can you provide a high level summary and the considerations for healthcare professionals when recommending or administering the vaccines? Sure. Now there are two vaccines and I'm not going to get too nerdy about this, but Pfizer's vaccine, Abrisvo, and GSK's vaccine, Apexv, both are anti-RSV vaccines. The Pfizer vaccine is a bivalent vaccine. There are two main strains of RSV, A and B. The GSK vaccine is a monovalent vaccine, but it contains an adjuvant, ASO1, and that's the same adjuvant that we're familiar with because that's the adjuvant that's in shingles vaccine. Both of these vaccines were very effective in preventing lower respiratory tract infection in their clinical, their respective clinical trials. The clinical trials were not done in exactly the same way with uh, the exactly the same uh, definitions of lower respiratory tract disease. Suffice it to say that the CDC's advisory committee and I think FDA's committee from the point of effectiveness considered them very, very similar. You get, depending upon your definition, for the more serious infections, anywhere from 60 to 90% protection against serious disease. So uh, that's very important. And I think that's the main thing we ought to consider. The CDC's advisory committee did not prefer one vaccine over the other. So we have now, and this is a wonderful advance, two vaccines that are licensed for people age 60 and older against RSV, which as you said, in many seasons rivals influenza in how much respiratory disease it actually causes in older adults. So these are big advances. So Bill, I, I think these obviously are great advances, but can you explain a little bit more about what shared clinical decision actually looks like? And the significance of this ACIP vote, and frankly, what you'll be telling your patients about these new vaccines. Right, and the distinction is, I guess, important. So uh, put yourself on the committee, and you're looking at a whole lot of new information. The first thing the committee obviously considered is that they are new vaccines. They're a little bit more cautious about universally recommending new vaccines. And then there was some criticism about, about both clinical trials because there were some committee members who said, you know, there weren't enough older, older people in these trials, not enough people who were nursing home residents in these studies. They wanted more information. 
They also wanted more data on the duration of protection. Of course, early on, we don't have that for Pfizer's vaccine. For a season and a half, it looks as though this vaccine continues to provide protection. GSK's vaccine ran a little longer in its clinical trial, and they had data after two seasons, which also suggested that these vaccines maintain their protection for longer than one season. But still, the committee said these data are modest. There was also limited information about co-administration with other adult vaccines. They had some data on influenza vaccine co-administration that seemed to go well, but there were, once again, limited data there, and they were concerned about costs. And then lastly, there was some caution because in both trials, there were some interesting and fortunately very uncommon serious adverse events. There were some neuroinflammatory syndromes that occurred among vaccinees, Guillain-Barre syndrome and the like. And in one of the trials, the GSK trial, there was a difference between the vaccine group and the placebo group in the occurrence of new cases of atrial fibrillation. I, I will say the general sense of the committee was that these are safe vaccines because obviously they've been licensed, uh, but there was just a little bit of caution. And so putting all those things together, they decided to uh, not recommend it universally, but to say, why don't you as a practitioner have a conversation with each of your patients uh, because uh, we're not recommending it just universally. Now that said, I'm going to be recommending it pretty universally um, for all my patients age 60 and older. And uh, my wife and I are in that age group and we have every intention of receiving these vaccines ourselves. <laughs> so, so Bill, it's real interesting because the, the vaccines will be offered this fall, just as we encourage everyone age six months and older to get an annual influenza vaccine, as well as updated COVID-19 boosters and vaccines. So the real question is, is it safe to give all of these vaccines at the same time? And if so, how do we really know? I, I, I don't think we know yet, Marla, whether we can give all three vaccines sim simultaneously. And I don't think there are many practitioners or many patients who are going to go for that. So there'll have to be more than one visit. Giving any of these vaccines along with influenza vaccine, that seems to be fine. But as to adding more vaccines at any one time, I think at this point, since we don't have data, we ought to be cautious. But that does mean we're going to have to encourage our patients to come back for another visit to make sure that they get these vaccines. So cautious, but diligent. <laughs> exactly. So I'll shift gears a little, Bill. There's certainly been an increased awareness on health disparities and equity and access in general. Um, certainly RSV is another disease that disproportionately impacts communities of color. Um, so what is being done to help ensure that the new vaccines are available and affordable for all who need them? Well, the short answer is obviously there are disparities in how we make vaccines available to the entire spectrum of the population of adults that we have in the United States in our wonderfully diverse country. So we all recognize that we need to do more to assure that we provide these preventive health services which are so valuable and so successful to everyone for whom we uh, provide care. Uh, a good thing to note is that these new RSV vaccines will be covered under Part D, as in David, uh, of Medicare. So as of January this year, 2023, there are no more co-pays under Part D. Uh, but a lot of physicians don't uh, provide vaccines under Part D. That's, of course, the prescription drug benefit in their offices because they don't want to wrestle with the administrative complexities. But that's where our friends in pharmacy 
becomes so much more important because they can deliver these vaccines efficiently in the pharmacy. And we as physicians must make sure that our patients receive the vaccines, whether in our offices or in a pharmacy. So that's very important. Uh, emphasizing what you've just said, namely that these are subpopulations uh, that often are impacted more severely by the illnesses. So we need to make a special effort that we can extend the benefit of these vaccines to those very populations who need it the most. It, it takes a village for sure. So Bill, we've been talking mostly about adults age 60 and older, but there are also new vaccines and monoclonal antibodies for pregnant women and infants who are at greater risk for severe RSV disease. Any predictions you can share from that crystal ball of yours? <laughs> well, Marla, I don't think I need much of a crystal ball because as you say, there is a new vaccine which is available for infants and also a new monoclonal antibody, nirsevimab, uh, both of those are designed to prevent RSV infection in infants who are, of course, extraordinarily vulnerable to very severe RSV disease. The CDC's advisory committee is already discussing recommendations along with the American Academy of Pediatrics about how to actually deploy these new wonderful preventive measures and we'll hear from them very, very soon. RSV prevention is a hot topic. So we'll hear a lot more about um, prevention, both uh, for infants and children, as well as for adults in the coming months. So stay tuned. So Bill, before we sign off, you know, once again, this has been so helpful. I'll give you the opportunity to offer any other final words of wisdom. Well, I don't know if they're words of wisdom, but they are words of good intention. We have influenza vaccine, just to reiterate, a COVID vaccine, a new monovalent booster, which we anticipate will be available this fall, and the newbies, RSV vaccine. We should try to make these vaccines as widely available to the indicated populations as possible. And for people age 60 and over, all three will be indicated. We have a lot of work ahead of us this fall, but we can do a lot of good. Indeed. Bill, thanks again for your valuable insights as always. And thank you all for tuning in to this special episode of the Schaffner Report.